Long before cosmic horror and weird fiction came gothic horror, a genre which deals with themes of human morality, mortality, philosophy and religion. It merges deep desires and passions with haunting cold dread, often presented with a backdrop of isolated castles, deep dark dungeons and gloomy forests, the genre is a window into the superstitions and fears of a time since past. In this video, I'll be covering a brief history of the genre and the core themes and philosophies present. Before we begin, if you like the content, please consider leaving a like and a comment, and if you want to stay up to date with my videos, hit the subscribe and bell buttons to be notified of future uploads. The novel that first established the gothic fiction genre was Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, published in 1764, and was, and I quote, an attempt to blend the two kinds of romance, the ancient and the modern, as stated by Walpole in the preface of the second edition of the book. Also in this preface, he cites Shakespeare as an inspiration, and many of his works make allusions to Shakespeare in one way or another. The tales that succeeded The Castle of Otranto largely utilised spirits, demons and even human antics antagonists. But in 1818, Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein marked a shift in the genre that would forever change it. Frankenstein was the first in the genre to depict mankind's folly personified in a neither living nor dead creature born of scientific experiments gone wayward, and is considered to be one of the most important pieces of gothic fiction to date. The Victorian era, 1837 to 1901, produced the most well-known stories in the genre. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, Dracula by Bram Stoker, and The Strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Louis Stevenson were all published during this era. Superstition was still very prevalent, despite being a time of scientific enlightenment, and these superstitions were woven into the very identity of the genre itself, but by the end of the era, the genre was much more varied in its antagonists. The setting of gothic horror varies from dilapidated castles to gloomy forests and cobbled Victorian estates. They're places with rich historical backgrounds, sometimes of substantial importance to the protagonists and their families. Devious plots, occult deeds and family legacies are entwined within these places, and these locations are so important to the genre that it's as if they're almost characters themselves. Whether it's spotting a shadowy figure on the ramparts of a derelict castle, or a woman in a white dress wandering among the creatures of a swamp, the word I would use to describe the genre's cadence is gloom. A thick, moody atmosphere, foggy and often with tumultuous weather such as thunderstorms are staples of the genre, more so than in any of its gore-laden counterparts wherein damage to the human body is the primary spectacle. Some of the real-world geographical locations used in these tales have become synonymous with their fictional gothic lurkers. For instance, both Transylvania and the small British seaside town Whitby have both become synonymous with Count Dracula. I've known people to genuinely believe that Dracula was a real person and did in fact visit Whitby where he conducted his reign of terror. Of course, these events never happened, but I think it's a testament to how powerful well-written fiction can be. The themes of gothic horror can differ somewhat depending on the chosen villain. For example, in supernatural fiction, it often addressed the field of psychology by rendering unresolved inner conflicts in a symbolic manner, i.e. a murderer being haunted by their victim, representing the murderer's guilty conscience. The inner and outer dilemmas of protagonists are closely intertwined. The antagonistic forces present are often personifications of both. The supernatural can never be truly erased, only repressed, and the repressed cannot be destroyed, only repressed further, whereas a villain such as the vampire would denote an admonition against adverse and deviant sexual behaviour, the vampire being a metaphor in some instances for lust or debauchery, and ultimately being defeated by the positive teachings of Christianity and strong Victorian values. So with this in mind, I'll keep this broad, explaining only the most commonly used themes of the genre. As I mentioned previously, antagonists are often personifications of the protagonist's past misdeeds or endured tragedies, re-emerging as the physical or metaphysical manifestations of emotional turmoil. In defeating, or sometimes being consumed by these presences, 
ultimately concludes both the inner and outer dilemmas of the characters. The genre is pervaded by a threatening atmosphere, usually unseen and felt on an instinctual level. Protagonists may apply logic and rationale to otherwise supernatural happenings or vice versa. This is enhanced by the emotional turmoil suffered by protagonists and it makes for truly engrossing tales as the reader or viewer, much like the protagonist, attempts to make sense of the things around them. Often connected to the very geography of the story, for for example, a castle or a forest, prophecies are usually unwittingly brought into fruition by the protagonist's actions or lack thereof. Prophecies are mostly obscure, partial, or deliberately confusing. Metonymy is a subtype of metaphor, in which something like rainfall or lightning is used to communicate something else such as a mood. For example, a thunderstorm being used to communicate impending dread, or using rainfall to denote sorrow. It's used so commonly in the genre that it's now a major staple, and you'd be hard pressed to find a gothic horror novel that does not use this to some degree. Often supernatural in nature, events such as a knight's helmet falling on a character without logical reasoning, or a glass being held at the protagonist by an unseen presence, are extremely commonplace in the genre. In some works, these events are explained logically, and in others, are indeed supernatural. The Victorian era was rife with an obsession of death. So much so that historians have dubbed this era and its people the cult of death. And with this in mind, it falls to reason why many of the genre's works possess a morbid fascination with human mortality. Many of the genre's works attempt to romanticise the passing of human life, while others simply lay bare its effects on those still living. And protagonists often progress on a journey of acceptance of their mortality, or folly, in one way or another. Many gothic novels and short stories aim to display the underlying sinister motivations of human nature. They depict the deep desires and passions that lie beneath the facade of socially engineered morality. This is usually done through the use of metaphors. In an essay published by UKEssays.com titled Analyzing Philosophical Ideas in Gothic Literature, the author of the essay, whose name is not credited on the work, draws upon parallels between the philosophical idea of the sublime and gothic fiction. The author writes, The sublime experience, as stated by the critic Longinus, is a matter of treatment. The particular form of the sublime experience that requires prepossessing objects is not the only form, it is simply the form in which enthusiasm preponderates over irony. The Castle of Otranto is the first gothic novel written by Horace Walpole, in which the idea of the sublime is presented through its physical, transcending and overpowering imagery. This experience is also illustrated in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Both novels explore the idea and concept of the sublime, and show the theoretical notions through its characters and themes come Conveyed. Now, for those unfamiliar with this idea, the sublime is the philosophy of greatness, whether physical, moral, intellectual, metaphysical, aesthetic, spiritual, or artistic. The genre can use this in a plethora of ways. For example, Mary Shelley, in her novel Frankenstein, uses nature to show the raw power of the sublime to set the dark tone for the book. In Dracula by Bram Stoker, nature, again, is used to show the sublime with the following description. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. But while being used to denote a sense of abject terror, looming disaster, or misery, the sublime can also be used to the effect of tranquility and respite. Take this description from Frankenstein, for example. My spirits were elevated by the enchanting appearance of nature. The past was blotted from my memory, the present was tranquil, and the future gilded by bright rays of hope and anticipations of joy. The author of the essay concludes that the philosophical idea of the sublime is very important to consider in relation to the study of gothic fiction. Without the sublime features in a gothic novel, the narrative would feel as though it were heading towards another genre. If the main aim was to convey a gothic feel or experience, the sublime is necessary to consider. It's easy to see how gothic fiction has influenced contemporary horror. The Bronte sisters, Charles Dickens, H.P. Lovecraft, Arthur Macken, and Algernon Blackwood, to name but a few influential authors, all drew heavily from the genre while adding their own unique traits to it. More recently though, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein majorly influenced the entire creature feature subgenre of films, as did Dracula. Beyond that, in the paranormal genre, many of the common tropes and 
quote-unquote rules of the paranormal hauntings are taken directly from gothic fiction. This is largely due to the genre itself being so incredibly influential, but also because of the period in which the genre flourished. Whenever I think of creepy periods throughout history, my mind always wanders to the Victorian era because of the scientific enlightenment of its people, while simultaneously being a time of unknowing. With John William Polder's Vampire, published in 1819, came the birth of the modern vampire, and would subsequently shape the way in which future vampire tales were told. It introduced readers to the strong, aristocratic vampire archetype who dwells within the halls of an ancient castle and who preys on the unassuming damsel. Following this came Camilla, written by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, and published in 1872, which birthed the sexy, black, widow-esque vampiress, until finally, the most influential vampire story ever written was published in 1897, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Without these novels, the modern vampire as seen in films such as Fright Night, The Lost Boys, and Interview with the Vampire would not exist. They created a new, modernised mythology for the creatures that are the subject of some of my all-time favourite pieces of horror fiction. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and yes, I am aware that this particular novel has been referenced in this video multiple times, but it's so influential to modern horror for a reason, shaped the theme of failed scientific experiments creating unnatural beings. For instance, films such as The Fly and Reanimator, an iteration of Lovecraft's novella Herbert West Reanimator, heavily borrow from Frankenstein. Again, much like what Vampire, Camilla, and Dracula did for vampires, Frankenstein did the same for science has gone mad. So that wraps up this video. What's your favourite gothic horror story? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.